it's recording. Okay, but you have to push the button down so that I get the green light. Ready? Did you push the button down? I did. <laughs> Which of the two? Okay, there's a red light. There we go. Now we've got a green light. It's recording? That's yes. Cool. All right, so... Uh, get delayed by United, which is quite likely because they couldn't figure out how to get us from the jetway to the plane coming to Pittsburgh today. Uh, I will have time to upload the video. If not, the video will be up tomorrow. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about Benford's law of digit bias and talk a little bit about some of the applications. There's a lot more slides here than I will get to in 50 minutes. Uh, this is deliberate so that you know, if you're interested in something, hopefully I can see that on your faces and dwell on that. If you're bored, I can hopefully move on or you can always look at these and ask me questions later. All right, so let's start with a motivating question. For a nice data set, and as a mathematician, for me, nice includes things like Fibonacci numbers, uh, stock prices, street addresses of college employees and students. What percent of leading digits are one? So I want somebody right now who doesn't know anything about Benford's Law, if you just had to guess randomly, or maybe with the benefits of a Carnegie Mellon education, what would you say, that's where I am today, right? Okay. What would you say is the probability of a first digit being one? First naive guess. Yes? 10%. 10 percent. Excellent. Thank you. And then you realize, of course, that you had a brain freeze, and it can't be 10 percent, and you correct to? 11 percent. 11 percent. One ninth. Because we're not going to have a leading digit of zero. And so the natural guess is you know, something like 10 percent, 11 percent. OK? And you know, if you're actually doing any experiment, you, know, you should have some fluctuations. It shouldn't be perfect, because then people will think you've forged the data. All right. The actual answer is Benford's law, and in a lot of data sets, such as uh, Fibonacci numbers, which we'll prove later today, you actually have a first digit of 1 about 30% of the time, going all the way down to about 4.5% of the time having a first digit of 9. And what I want to do is I want to give you a couple of explanations as to why this is true and why you might care about this. And so depending on who you are, the why you might care can be different. It could be a theoretical or it could be an application. All right, so here's just a couple of examples. So here's Fibonacci numbers, uh, most common iPhone passcodes, <laughs> Twitter users by number of followers. Um, somebody can tell me what that is later. And then distances of stars from Earth. Okay, that's physics, that one I understand. So you see this pattern of digit bias in a lot of different places. There are some places you should not expect to see it. If I look at, oh, I don't know, temperature in Fahrenheit, you know, at you know, 4 p.m. each day in March in Pittsburgh. I'm not expecting to see a lot of leading digits one, or maybe not, well, maybe this year, but <laughs> most years I would not expect to see that many leading digits of one. So you would expect that data would be clustered. So there should be some kind of spread across a couple of orders of magnitude. That should be one of the ingredients in terms of where this Benfordness is coming from. All right, so for today I'm going to explain Benford's law. I'll discuss some examples and applications. I'll sketch the proofs. And if time permits, which almost surely it won't, I'll talk about open problems. But if I don't get to that, either send me an email or go down to the conclusion slide. All right. So before I go into too much detail, I want to just iterate. Since I am going to be talking about applications, it's nice to know the limitations of a method. So a math test indicating fraud is not proof that fraud has happened. Unlikely events can occur. So I actually emailed Scott Adams for permission to use this strip. So I love it. You know, the evil director of human resources is talking to Dilbert. Uh, your travel expenses are rejected because all of your meal costs are round numbers. You're a liar or worse. I decide what to order based on what totals to a round number after 15% tip. That's worse. <laughs> there are unlikely explanations. So you've got to keep that in mind just because your test says this is unlikely. Well, maybe you're using a test that's not appropriate. And I'm not going to get into too much detail on the Iranian elections from a couple of years ago, but this was a place where Benford's Law was used. You know, was something going on there? And you've got to be very careful. Are you using the right test at the right time? So there's a lot of different examples where Benford's Law occurs. You know, recurrence relations, special functions, iterates of maps, products of random variables, L functions, 3x plus 1, some of these we'll talk about, order statistics, financial data, hierarchical Bayesian models. You can see my stumbling in you know, big words like that, that you know, leave words like homology. So lots of different places where you will see Benford's Law. What are the major applications? Here's three of them. One is analyzing round off errors. Another is trying to figure out what is the optimal way to store numbers. But the most important is determining whether or not there's fraud that's happening. Or maybe instead of saying fraud, maybe data integrity is a better choice of words. Is maybe your machine is just not recording data properly through no fraud, nothing malicious, 
but you're not getting the right values. And this is one of the great benefits of Benford's Law. It's cheap. If I give you a number and I ask you what's the first digit, that's not a hard question. And so we can use that to make a lot of really good inferences. And if you think about it, if you're trying to detect fraud, you have a finite amount of resources and you want to decide how do I want to allocate, which things do I want to look at. Well, one thing is to treat everybody equally. This leads to Granny taking off her belt and her sneakers as she goes through the security line because she is as likely as everyone else to be a terrorist. Or this trying to use methods like Benford's Law to figure, well, if I think a company or an individual is making up data, can I use a quick, dirty test like this to get a better sense of where I should do the more detailed, uh, more superior test? All right. So let's talk a little bit about general theory. So you know the same plot from before. You know it's too much work to generate something new. For many data sets, the probability of observing a first digit base b of d is about the log base b of d plus one over d. And so base ten. This means about thirty percent of the time you'll have a first digit of one. So you see this profound bias. So what I want to do in this talk is show you why this profound bias exists, and then later tell you, well, actually, there's no bias if you look at the numbers the right way. And this bias is only the effect of us looking at numbers the wrong way. All right, so just some background material. I was told that there are people of all levels. We need a little bit of basic abstract algebra. I've never taken the class. I've taught it, but I've never taken it. But this is, I've been told, one of the things you learn in that class. So modulo, a equals b mod c if a minus b is an integer times c. So anybody who has ever looked at a clock because they're bored in a lecture already knows how to do mod arithmetic base 12. All right? So for us, what's going to be really important is looking at modular arithmetic with the modulus of 1. So what we're going to basically just say is two numbers will be the same if they have the same fractional part. All right, the next is significant. This is a fancy way of saying scientific notation. If you give me a non-negative number, I can write it as the significant times 10 to the k. k is an integer, and the significant is between 1 and 10. So if I give you the number 0 0.000314, okay, I've got 3.14, that's putting my number is the significant between 1 and 10, and then k is going to be some negative number telling me how much I have to shift over because of those leading zeros. And the last thing is, if two numbers have the same significance, well, then they've got the same leading digits. And conversely, if they have the same leading digits, they have the same significance. The only way they differ is by, those, by the integer in the 10 to the k. And all that does is that affects how many leading zeros you have, or how many trailing zeros you have at the end. All right, so the key observation is if I have two numbers, x and x tilde, and if their logarithms base 10 are equal mod 1, yes? Wait, so with 0 .00314, the yes. was 3? The significant was 3.14. Okay. So the significant is going to be a number between 1 and 10. So if I'm actually thinking of the number pi, you know, its significant would be 3.14159. And then I'm sure there's somebody here who can go further than me. Couldn't x and x bar have the same leading digits but not have the same significance? Yeah. Like, what is that? Uh, for, for me, leading digits goes all the way. I'm not just talking about first digit. I'm talking about all. I'm t so there, there are some people who just look at just the first digit, and then there are other people who look at all the digits. So I apologize that this is not phrased clearly. For me, I'm looking at all the digits. Now, frequently, when we're doing the tests, we only do the test on the first digit, but we talk about all the digits because it makes it a little bit easier. W was there a question from this side? I, I was going to point at the same thing. Okay. Okay. So the key observation is two numbers have the same logarithm mod 1 if and only if they have the same leading digits. And for those of you who know Fourier analysis, what's really going on is we're going to want to do a kind of transformation. We're going to transform from x to the log of x base 10 mod 1. And in general, order matters. So if you have a bank account, which would you rather have happen? The bank compounds how much money you have, then I add a million dollars to your account. Or I add a million dollars, and then the bank compounds and figures out your interest. So in general, order matters. And if you switch the order of events, you're going to get a different answer. What's nice about the exponential function, uh, if I look at e to the 2 pi i u and e to the 2 pi i u mod 1, Every time I increase u by 1, I don't change the complex exponential. And so what this is telling us is I can chop off the integer part. Hey, that's really nice because when I'm looking at these Benford stuff, all I care about is the fractional part. I don't care about the integer. So if you know Fourier analysis, this should tell you why Fourier analysis plays such a key role in all these Benford problems. Because you don't have to worry about the mod 1, and it allows you to just take the logarithm. Okay. 
So the other concept we need is equidistribution. So I'm going to look at numbers that are between 0 and 1. And I'll say my sequence is equidistributed if the fraction of the time I lean in the subinterval AB is just the length of that subinterval. So if AB has length 1 quarter, then a quarter of the time I should land there. If it's 5 sixths, I should land there about 5 sixths of the time. And so here's a, a very nice theorem. If you take an irrational number, then n beta is equidistributed mod 1. So this is often called Kronecker's theorem. Uh, there's a lot of proofs either using number theory or ergodic theory. If you think about it, if beta is rational, if beta is 1 fifth, if I look at n beta, I get 1 fifth, 2 fifths, 3 fifths, 4 fifths, 5 fifths, which is 0 mod 1, 6 fifths, which is 1 fifth. So for a rational number, it cycles. So clearly, if I take a rational number, then n beta is not going to be equidistributed. And what's wonderful is as long as you stay away from those rational numbers, you will always have equidistribution. All right, so here's some examples. The log of 2 base 10 and the log base 10 of the golden mean are both going to be irrational numbers. And so you know, you're always supposed to prove at least something in a talk. So let's prove the log of 2 base 10 is irrational. If it was rational, I could write it as 2 equals 10 to the p over q. I raise both sides to the q. I say, well, 10 is 2 times 5. So I simplify, I get 2 to the q minus p is 5 to the p. I'll leave this as an exercise as to why this is not possible. And so this proves that the log of 2 base 10 is irrational. As a nice exercise, prove the log of the golden mean is also irrational. All right. Um, I don't want to risk taking my computer out and actually doing an experiment live. My computer has crashed too many times in the past week. It's infected with Windows. So I'm going to just <laughs> write a data set for a number I chose. I can't even line set random. I deliberately chose this number. I chose square root of pi deliberately. And so I'm trying to see is, the, is you know, n square root of pi, does that look like it's equidistributed mod 1? And what I like about this number is it would be suspicious if each bin from 0 to 1 tenth, 1 tenth to 2 tenth had exactly one number. So I have at least some fluctuation here. Then what happens is I increase n. This is looking at the first 10, first 100, first 1,000, first 10,000. So if you have really good eyesight, you can see there's a small little fluctuation at the top. And you can see the equidistribution, at least with these nice bins, is setting in fairly quickly. All right, so here is the fundamental equivalence. So we say. We want to know when is a data set Benford? When does it have this digit bias? Well, a data set is Benford base b if and only if the log of your numbers, mod 1, is equidistributed. So this is a really nice, easy test. And what it tells you is if the log process is equidistributed, then the original sequence is Benford. The other way of looking at this is you are looking at numbers the wrong way. Whenever anybody gives you a number, the very first thing you should do is you should take its logarithm base 10 and then throw away the integer part. And if you look at numbers like this, then you will have equidistributed. There'll be no bias. <coughs> now, there's no way that this is ever going to happen in practice because we actually need the original legitimate values. But if you look at numbers in this transformed setting, you will not see any bias. So for instance, let's say x, we'll write it as the significant times 10 to the k. When we take the logarithms, we see they differ just by that k. It's down to just studying the log of the significant. And that's why the mod 1 is going to interact with this so nicely. So here's a little chart. So down here is the log of x up top as I'm looking at numbers from 1 to 10. And you know, 0, when I exponentiate, 10 to the 0 is 1. Uh, what about the number 2? What exponentiates to 2? Well, the log of 2 base 10, that exponentiates to 2. Well, the log of 2 base 10 is about 0.3. And so what they're telling you is all of these numbers here will exponentiate to having a leading digit of 1, while only the numbers down here will exponentiate to having a leading digit of a 9. So what happens is, if a sequence is uniformly distributed, is equidistributed on the log scale, it's going to have this bias on the natural scale. So just rotating the you know, chart 90 degrees, if I want to calculate the probability I have a first digit of d, I look at the probability I have a first digit of at most d plus 1, subtract the probability of having a first digit of at most d, and that difference will give me the probability of a leading digit of d. And that's where the log of d plus 1 over d or 1 plus 1 over d comes from. Just saying, I want to look at you know, all the numbers between here. And so this gives you a sense of where this bias is coming from. All right, so let's give some examples of Benfordness. So 2 to the n is Benford. And the proof is very simple. We showed that the log of 2 base 10 is irrational. So that means n times the log of 2 base 10 is equidistributed. And we know that a sequence, if it's equidistributed, when we exponentiate it, we get Benford. So 2 to the n is Benford. 
All right, well, this is not that important of a sequence. What's important here is that we can put 2 to the n in a more general framework. So 2 to the n is an example of a very boring, well, it's a very boring example of a difference equation. So a difference equation relates your current value to some previous values. And there's lots of different ways you can do this. You know, the simplest ones to study are linear recurrences of fixed depth. The most famous of these is the, the Fibonacci numbers. And so if we look at the Fibonacci numbers, they're Benford. So here's the recurrence relation. And to emphasize the fact that I want to look at this as a recurrence relation, I'm not going to use the letter F. I'm going to use the letter A. A n plus 1 equals A n plus A n minus 1. I should also give initial conditions, but I'll skip that for now. There's lots of different ways to solve the Fibonacci relation and get a closed form expression. It's one of my favorite results in all of mathematics. I'm assuming this clock is not even close to being accurate. Yes, OK. OK, that's what I figured. Um, I just have a flight at 8 o'clock and uh, had a small heart attack. <laughs> and so my favorite method of solving the Fibonacci numbers and getting the closed form expression is the method of divine inspiration. Have any of you ever heard of the method of divine inspiration? It's wonderful. Have you used it before? Essentially, yes. Um, we pronounce it God, but God professes mm, very, very, very similar. Very, very similar. And so let's guess that a n equals r to the n. And there's natural reasons to say this. And so if I wrote a n plus 1, clearly a n plus 1 is less than twice a n. You know, my sequence is you know, a n plus 1 is greater than a n is greater than a n minus 1 in general. So if a n plus 1 equal twice a n, I would get my sequences doubling. So my sequence is growing slower than 2 to the n. But it's growing faster than twice a n minus 1, which could, would give me a growth rate of square root of 2 to the n. So I know my sequence is growing at a rate somewhere between root 2 to the n and 2 to the n. Ah, let's guess it's growing at a rate of r to the n exactly. So again, a little bit of an assumption, but you can then take that assumption and work with it. All right, this is tough as a Bostonian, so a to the n is r to the n, so r to the n plus 1 equals r to the n plus r to the n minus 1. r squared is r plus 1. We solve, we get the roots of r equals 1 plus or minus root 5 over 2. Then what's nice is because this is a linear recurrence relation, if I take a solution and I multiply by 5 or any constant, it's still a solution. If I take two solutions and I add them, it's still a solution. So I get that the general solution is C1R1 to the n plus C2R2 to the n. And once you give me any two Fibonacci numbers, I can use that to now find these two coefficients C1 and C2. And this leads to Binet's formula. This is one of my favorite formulas in all of mathematics. And so if you were to describe the Fibonacci numbers with one word, what kind of numbers would you call them? No. <laughs> it's the golden mean, but what kind of numbers are they? I'm sorry? Integral. Integral or integer, right? If you were facing a bunch of numbers in a police lineup and trying to figure out you know, which number did this to you on the exam, <laughs> does this look like an integer? You've got square roots. You've got divisions. This is always an integer. As a nice exercise, well, what can I replace the fives and the twos with and still always get an integer back? Not only is this an integer, it's close to being a power of the golden mean. 1 minus root 5 over 2, that's less than 1 in absolute value. So if n gets really, really large, this is negligible. I'm an analytic number theorist, which almost means I'm an accountant. And I look at you know, the main terms and the minor terms, and I basically try to justify throwing things away. Ah, in the limit, that's insignificant. The 1 minus root 5 over 2, it's. So essentially, the nth Fibonacci number is essentially the golden mean to the n with this multiplicative factor of 1 over root 5. Well, if I take logarithms, the log of 1 over root 5, that's just a constant shift. And essentially, I just have its logarithms as n times the log of the golden mean. Ah, I know the log of the golden mean is irrational. The rest is now just putting in epsilons and deltas and just making a rigorous argument and just keeping track of all the errors. But this is essentially the proof that the Fibonacci numbers are Benford. You can consider more general linear recurrences, and most linear recurrences are Benford. You've got to be a little bit careful. So you know, we talked about an plus 1 equals 2an. If I give you an plus 1 is 2an minus an minus 1, this one is not Benford. And your two fun sequences, if you take a0 equals a1 equals 1, every number in the sequence is 1. You get 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Yes, we have a digit bias, but the digit bias is a little bit too strong in this case. Uh, the other fun example is a0 is 0, a1 is 1, a2 is 2, a3 is 3, a4 is 4. I'll leave the rest as an exercise. You don't get Benford there. You actually get something that's oscillating in terms of the percentage. 
What goes wrong here is if you look at the characteristic polynomial, if you look at the roots r, you get a double root of 1. And that's what's causing problems. But almost every linear recurrence will lead to benefit behavior. Why is this important? Well, linear recurrences, difference equations, these are discrete versions of differential equations. Differential equations and difference equations describe a lot of how the world evolves. And this gives you some idea of why you might see benefit in so many different places. All right. So here are some digits of 2 to the n. Uh, the numbers get really large, so I can only display the first 30 on the screen. I apologize. Uh, I've displayed, though, tabulations for the first 60 values. So I've proved to you that 2 to the n is Benford. Are you convinced by looking at the data? OK, so which data looks suspicious to you? Which one? I mean, I'm pretty happy with one. Which one do you like the least? Nine. Good, because that's the one I highlighted. Nine <laughs> definitely looks the worst. Does anybody here know Greek or Roman? Or Latin, I guess, Greek or Latin. Anybody know Greek or Latin at all? No one? Can somebody tell me the difference between giga and mega? OK, so they differ by a factor of 10 cubed. All right. How many gigabytes are in a megabyte? Sorry. How many megabytes are in a gigabyte? You can't answer the other. I'm sorry? 1,024. So either the computer scientists do not know their ancient languages, or they realize, ah, let's just appropriate the words, and let's call it gigabytes, megabytes. But it's not 1,000 megabytes in a gigabyte. It's 1,024. So 10 cubed is approximately 2 to the 10th. Why is this important for what's going on? What this means is every time I increase n by 10, I almost return to where I was initially padded with three zeros. Not quite. If 2 to the 10 exactly equal 10 cubed, my sequence would not be Benford. I would just cycle through the same 10 values. And this is why, if you look at these numbers, 512, 524, 536, the numbers are only slowly increasing. Going from here to here is you know, 10 later. It takes a long time for the benefitness to set in because 2 to the 10 is so close to an integral power of 10. And so if you're somebody like the IRS who uses stuff like this to detect tax fraud, you want to know, well, is this evidence? Is this indicating something suspicious is happening? And when you have small data sets, it's a very difficult question to know, is there enough to pull the trigger and do an audit? So again, I'm not choosing three random numbers. I'm choosing gamma, e, and pi. If you don't know what those numbers are, stay as a math major and you will learn. And what I'm doing is I'm calculating the chi-squared value. So this is a statistic that tells me how good of a job Benford's Law does of describing their first digit distribution. Uh, if you've ever watched Sesame Street, I have young kids. One of the routines is one of these numbers is not like the other. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things doesn't belong. All right, this is a pretty easy one, but which one doesn't belong? Yeah. So what do you think? Do you think pi eventually becomes Benford when I look at powers of pi? As long as the log of pi base 10 is irrational, it will be Benford. But if you look at the data, I mean, everything else is getting small. The numbers are really small. Pi starts at 46, goes down to 10, goes down to 0 0.05. Good job. But then it bumps up to 6, still down at 2.9. All right, so one of the advantages of being a place at Carnegie Mellon is I don't have to ask who knows digits of pi. I get to ask questions, who knows more than 40 digits of pi? <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on. What? Nobody knows 20 digits of pi. All right. All right, how many people know seven digits of pi squared? <laughs> you stopped at pi? <laughs> wow. Uh, so, so I guess asking for like pi cubed is just out. <laughs> pi to the four. So here is a plot of the log of the chi-squared value. So the smaller the chi-squared value, the better the fit. And the reds are pi to the n, and the blues are e to the n. And you can see the chi-squared values for the blues are getting really small. Anybody notice anything interesting about the chi-squared for pi? Kind of period. You want to guess at the period? Roughly. About 180. About 175. Pretty good guess. 
So pi to the 175 is approximately 1.0028 times 10 to the 87. So what this means is every time you go through 175 values of pi, you almost return to where you started padded by 87 zeros. And that's why you get this periodicity, or almost periodicity. So one of the things I'm very interested in studying is these rates of convergence and how the structure of the number affects these rates of convergence. This is something the IRS cares about. And I've actually done some work with students for the IRS that I'm not allowed to talk about. But uh, I was going to say more on that later, but no, I won't. Um, but so when you look at something like this, the algebraic structure of your number has a huge role to play. And so what I like about this is it combines a lot of different branches of mathematics. You have the applications, you have the analysis, and you also have the algebra all coming together. And when we talk about 3x plus 1 later today, I'll talk a little bit uh, more about stuff along these lines. All right. So why Benford's Law? So not all data sets satisfy Benford's Law. So one of the easiest examples to imagine is you have a street where the houses are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, going all the way up to L. And you can ask, well, what percent of the houses have a first digit of 1? Well, not surprisingly, depending on how long your street is, that's going to profoundly affect the answer. If L is about you know, 200 or 2,000 or 20,000, you've just had a long stretch of 1s, and you expect to have about 5 ninths of your leading digits being a 1. Conversely, if L is about 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, you've just had a long stretch of non-1s, and you expect to be closer to 1 ninth. And so if I just plot it over here, you can see the probability of a first digit 1 versus the street length oscillating. This is the wrong way to look at the data. I should be looking at not the length of the street, but the log of the length of the street. And when you compress it like this, you get a much better distribution in terms of what's going on. So what if we have many streets of different lengths, which is far more reasonable in a non-communist nation where we allow cities to build any way they want. I am from Boston. And so you have all streets of different lengths going in different directions. What would happen then? And one of the main ideas in the subject is the more amalgamation you have, the more smoothing you have, the more benefitness you'll see. So you know, here's a string of uh, slides. The first is all houses, uh, the streets, I'm choosing 1,000 streets, and each street goes from 1 to, uh, to 10,000. And so when I look at this, you know, I'm getting a uniform distribution, which is exactly what you would expect. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at 1,000 streets. But what I'm going to do first is I'm going to randomly choose a length of my street from 1 to 10,000. And then I'll take all those houses, and then I'll choose another length randomly from 1 to 10,000. And that'll be my second street, and I'll take all the houses. So I'm going to have a one-level amalgamation. And when I do that, you can see it's a lot closer to Benford's Law. It's still not that good, but it's closer. So I can do it again. I'll do a random random. And I'll do it one more time, random random random. And at just three levels, you can already see a phenomenal fit. You know, this is the first digit, first two digits with Benford's Law. So the more smoothing you have going on, the more iterations of the process, the more benefit you're going to see. All right, so quick basic probability review. So if x is a random variable, uh, it means two things. It's non-negative, and it integrates to 1. And you know, the great lie or the, you know, that's often done is people talk in calculus classes about the need to calculate areas without ever saying why you want to calculate areas. Only once in my life has someone come up to me on the street and asked me to calculate an area. Um, if there's time, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> in probability, however, I am asked all the time to estimate odds of events by people everywhere. And probabilities are areas under curves. So if I want to know what's the probability x takes on a value between a and b, it's the area under the curve from a to b. This is why we care about areas under curves. This is one of the biggest applications. So other concepts, um, if you've ever taken a class with med school students, you need to know your mean, your average score, your variance, how spread out you are about the average score. One of my friends went to Harvard. They actually gave the third and the fourth moments so you could really determine how you were doing relative to the class. But for most of us, mean and variance is more than enough. Then independence. Knowledge of one variable gives you no information about knowledge of another. So hopefully, how long this talk goes and whether or not my US Airways flight takes off on time are independent events. Based on previous experience, I'm expecting my US Airways flight to be at least 20 minutes late, so I don't mind if I go over a little bit. But those should hopefully be independent events. Anybody ever watch Price is Right? Because in Price is Right, they have the showcase showdown. You have the big wheel. You spin the big wheel. Whoever gets closest to a dollar without going over wins. If you spin the wheel and then you don't like your spin, you can spin it again. Are those two spins independent? 
You're spinning the wheel twice. Why not? You don't reset. You don't reset the wheel to the same initial position. Or you might be the second person spinning and you might be trying to beat a certain number. You might be trying to give a certain force to get the wheel to enter a certain amount. You might be trying to get to a dollar. So you've got to be very careful as to whether or not there are dependencies or independencies. All right. So here is one of the most important distributions. If you ever teach a calculus class, this is your friend. This is the normal distribution. Uh, basically, e to the minus x squared, if I have the mean 0, uh, I have very low probability of having high events. And so the big theorem in probability is the central limit theorem. If you take a bunch of independent, identically distributed random variables, and you add them together, and you normalize by subtracting off the mean, and then you rescale so that the new quantity has standard deviation 1, this converges to being normally distributed with mean 0 and variance 1. This is a remarkable universality theorem. It says if you have, it doesn't really matter the fine shape of these distributions. If you keep adding them together, it becomes normally distributed. Now, this seems a little bit absurd at first. Well, shouldn't it matter what the shape of my distribution is? Yes. That affects how quickly it converges to being normally distributed. But the fact that you have convergence is independent of the shape of the distribution, so long as it's sufficiently nice. So again, the main result is if I keep adding independent, identically distributed random variables, and you can weaken these assumptions, you get a bell curve, you get a normal distribution, you get a Gaussian. Anything with this many names is important. Okay? You get some nice curve like this. And this is the key to one of the explanations of why Benford occurs in so many places. It's because the central limit theorem is so universal that Benford's law is also so universal. All right. So here is I'm taking a uniform random variable on negative 1 half, 1 half, and I'm comparing it to the normal distribution. And I'm rescaling so I have mean 0, variance 1. So do you think the uniform random variable looks like the bell curve, yes or no? No. It's not horrible, but it's not a great fit. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to add two independent uniform random variables. If you want to think of it as rolling two die. So you should be able to do this almost in your head. I'm teaching my daughter backgammon right now. Uh, she's proud that she almost shut me out in the first game she ever played. Uh, if you have two die, what's the least likely thing to roll? One, one, double ones, double sixes. What's the probability of rolling one of those? One in 36. What's the most likely number to roll for your sum? Seven. How likely is that? One sixth. So it turns out it's a triangular probability. And so if you do what goes on with continuous random variables, you see something very similar to rolling two dies with a triangle like this. What do you think? Good fit or bad fit to a normal distribution? It's at least better. If I go up to 4, if I go up to 8, you know, at 8 already, this is a really good fit. If you want, this is the explicit form of what you get if you sum four independent uniform random variables. All right. Don't ask what it looks like, excuse me, for 8. Uh, Mathematica was no longer speaking to me when I asked it to do 8. <laughs> and I really do not feel the need for the slide to actually do 8 by hand. You can write down explicitly what this is. If you want to work with a formula like this, either see me or see one of your professors, you have problems. We can help. Okay? <laughs> you don't want to work with something like this. You want to say, I want to work with that nice smooth curve. And the whole point of probability is to replace these nightmares with something smooth that you can work with easily. All right, so why is this related to Benford? Well, I need one more fact before I can show you the relation to Benford. What I've hopefully convinced you about is logarithms are good, and looking at things modular 1 is good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a normal distribution, and I'm going to look at it modular 1. And I'm going to ask, what's the probability density of my normal distribution? And I'm going to look at it for various values of the variance. So here the variance is 0 0.01. This is a very, very small variance. Okay. So if you think about what's going on, if the variance is 0.01, there's almost no fluctuations among people. Everybody's basically within about 0.04 of each other. So you would expect to see a huge peak in the probability. So something like this should not be too surprising that I don't have anything close to a uniform distribution when I look at the values modular 1. And so the gold line is the mod 1. The green line is the Gaussian mod 1. All right, now let's look at a variance of 0.1. Again, I'm still seeing some fluctuations, but the fluctuations are not that much now with a variance of 0.1. If I go up to a variance of 0.5, it looks at first like, here, there's a lot of fluctuation, until you actually look at the scale on the vertical axis going from 0.9999 to 1.0001. And so I'm not even bothering to draw the line anymore of you know, 
what the uniform density would be. What we're seeing here is that a Gaussian with increasing variance is becoming equidistributed mod 1. So this is another version of the central limit theorem. If you have a process who's <coughs> converging to normally distributed with increasing variance, if you just look at it log, uh, its logarithm, I'm sorry, if you just look at it mod 1, it's going to become uniformly distributed. Why is this important to Benford? So whenever I teach my students, they are eventually trained to have a Pavlovian response. If I am the teacher and they see a product, they should do logarithms. There's a reason you learn logarithms. How many of you have seen Riemann sums? How many of you have seen Riemann products? Exactly. <laughs> you could develop a whole theory of products, and we do. We develop it through summation by taking logarithms. And we convert all these statements about products to statements about sums. We have familiarity with sums. Convert things to sums. So if you ever have a product, convert it to sums, interpret it like that, and then at the end of the day, exponentiate. So now, let's say I give you a bunch of nice random variables, and I look at their product, and I want to know how does their product behave. What should we do? Well, yeah, given that this is on a slide that says Pavlovian response, see your product, take a logarithm, I like the idea of taking a logarithm. So let's let yi be the log of xi uh, base 10, let vn be the log of the product. And now vn is the log of the product, it's the sum of the logarithms, well, that's the sum of the yi's. Well, by the central limit theorem, that should become normally distributed with a growing variance. Ah, oh, well, something normally distributed with a growing variance, that then becomes Benford when I exponentiate back. So this is one reason why we see Benford in so many different places. OK, so moving on, applications. So uh, tale of two Steve Millers. Uh, hopefully, you can figure out which one I am. Anybody know who this one is? Yes, it's Steve. I, Ah, oh, good. These smart asses are not limited to Williams. Yes. Which Steve Miller is this? Not you. I'm sorry? Not, you. not me. He used to work for the Internal Revenue Service. He was one of many people to get sneered in the IRS scandal where it turns out the IRS was determining whom to audit or whom to cause trouble to, not based on possible fraud, but based on political allegiance. And so didn't use math, faced the consequences. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you how you can use math. So it's amazing what you can do with the Freedom of Information Act. This is from colleagues of mine, from somebody named Bill, married somebody named Hillary, has a daughter named Chelsea from somewhere in Arkansas. So I'll leave that in case you want to look at these later. <laughs> so a bank was having an internal audit, and it was found that they had a few more entries beginning with one number than they would have expected. Anybody have any idea what that number was? Nine. No. No, close though, five is close. Four. Yes, a lot more fours than they would expect. And they did a little bit more investigating and they found out not only was it fours, it was four what? There's no way for you to know, so just. Four, yeah, four nine, four eights. A lot of four eights and four nines. And eventually they traced a lot of these to one individual. Has anybody ever lost a credit card or had a credit card stolen? Okay, what do you do when that happens? Okay, you call and they tell you you're liable for all the charges and you're now gonna be in debt for the rest of your life or do they say, that's okay. We'll cancel your credit card, you're good. Yeah, the second one. Now imagine you're the credit card company and someone just calls up and they said their credit card's been stolen and you look and see this new $14.13 in disputed charges. Is it worth your time to investigate and find who stole the credit card? What if there's $28,000 in charges? So what a lot of companies did is they had an internal line. Anything above this line, you had to have an internal investigation to determine what happened. And anything below, you could just write it off. Anybody have any guesses as to what that write-off line was? 50. No, 50 is not a bad guess. It was 5,000. So anything below $5,000 you could write off. There was a worker at this company who had friends who would get credit cards, and they would get $4,800, $4,900 in purchases, and they would call, <gasps> Your credit card was, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Don't worry. Your credit card is now canceled. Everything is good. And so what you should do if you were this bank is anything above $5,000, maybe everything above $10,000 is audited. Anything from $8,000 to $10,000 has a 90% chance of being audited. Something like that so you don't have this fixed line that people can know about and incorporate. And so they actually were able to discover this fraud through Benford's Law. I'm not going to go into stream flow data, Iranian stuff. I'm just quickly going through that so that the slides are there. If you just hit pause on YouTube tomorrow, you can see those. I want to talk a little bit about applications to number theory. 
So how many people have seen the Riemann zeta function before? OK. So we have the zeta function is the sum of 1 over n to the s. Uh, it's 2015. Can somebody give me the next integer? This should not be this much of a pause. Next integer after 2015? 2016, OK. Sorry, there, there are some levels of prereqs for this talk. Uh, <laughs> can somebody give me the next prime after 2015? OK, more of a pause. The integers are very well understood. The reason the Riemann zeta function is so interesting is it relates the sum over integers to the product over primes. This has always got to be a product with me. And so the idea is we can use information about the distribution of integers to get information about the distribution of primes. It provides this wonderful formula linking the two. And the proof between this equivalence is the geometric series formula plus the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So I said here, and so you just expand everything out, and you collect terms. You have to be careful because you're dealing with the infinities. But you know, when you're careful, you can prove it. All right. So pi of x counts the number of primes at most x. A couple of properties of the Riemann zeta function and pi of x. The first is as s goes to 1, the sum of 1 over n to the s, that becomes the harmonic sum, the sum of 1 over n. The harmonic sum diverges. Therefore, there must be infinitely many primes. In fact, if you do a little bit more work, you can even get a growth rate as to how many primes there are at most x by looking at the harmonic series. A more interesting example is zeta of 2 is pi squared over 6. Because pi squared is irrational, there are infinitely many primes. And the reason is if pi squared were rational, then that means that product over primes has to be rational. When I put in s equals 2, I have a product of rational numbers. If they're only, I'm sorry, I said this wrong. wrong. Because pi squared is irrational, there are infinitely many primes. If there were finitely many primes, I would have a product of finitely many rational numbers, which is rational. Therefore, pi squared would have to be rational. So because pi squared is irrational, there must be infinitely many primes. And you can even cox out of this with a lot of work a growth rate on the number of primes. So I'm going to look at values of the Riemann zeta function where s equals 1 half. There's not enough time to go into why you care about the Riemann zeta function on the line 1 half. The famous Riemann hypothesis says all the non-trivial zeros of this function have real part of 1 half. There's a lot of connections between the distribution of these zeros and things in nuclear physics. And here is a plot of values of the Riemann zeta function at 1 half plus i k over 4. k goes up to that number and Benford's law. I forget which one is Benford and which one is the values of the Riemann zeta function because the fit is that good. Right, so briefly what's going on is I'm just going warp speed through these slides. You, know, you assume a bunch of technical conditions about your L functions, which I'm not going to get into. And then there's what's called the log normal law. And if you look at the logarithm of the Riemann zeta function, it becomes normally distributed with a growing variance on the line 1 half. That's exactly what we need for Benfordness. And you know, that leads to you know, results that if we have a good L function, we can prove Benfordness. All right. So what I want to end, I think I've got about six minutes left, is I want to talk a little bit about the 3x plus 1 problem. How many of you have heard of the 3x plus 1 problem? Okay. Two of my favorite quotes about it is by Kakatani, who called this a Soviet conspiracy to slow down American mathematics, because whenever he traveled, he would talk about it, and people would do nothing but work on it for a month and then give up in frustration. Uh, another quote is by Erdős, who says, mathematics is not yet ready for questions like this. So the 3x plus 1 problem, there's many definitions. Take an odd number, multiply by 3, add 1, and divide by the highest power of 2 you can, and then just keep iterating. And the conjecture is, eventually, you will iterate back to 1. And so if I start with the number 7, uh, I multiply by 3, add 1, divide by as many 2's as I can, I get to 11, 17, 13, 5, 1. And once I get to 1, I multiply by 3 and add 1, I get back to 4, which I immediately come back down to 1, and I'm stuck at 1 forever. These subscripts over here tell me how many powers of 2 I've pulled out. OK. And so I'm going to call my m path the values of the first uh, m numbers of two powers of 2 that I pull out. So you give me a cycle. And I'll tell you the m path. So the 2 path for this would be 1, 1. The 3 path would be 1, 1, 2. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in detail. I'll just leave this as a slide. This is a heuristic proof of the 3x plus 1 conjecture that everything goes to 1. Because it doesn't work, I'm not going to spend much time on it, but you can hit pause. So here is the theorem. As m goes to infinity, if you let xm be the mth iterate, and you divide by where you expect to be, then that converges to being Benford. This is not the theorem you want to prove. 
This is the thing that Alex Kontorovich and I were able to prove based on work he had done as an undergraduate at Princeton with Sinai. It was what our methods were naturally suited for. I then gave a talk at the University of Michigan, and Jeff Lagarius and Sandra Rajan, uh, Sandra can't be, I say his name, it's wrong, uh, got interested in this problem, and they proved a better result. And their result is, if you look at a lot of starting seeds, and you look at all the stuff as you go down, for almost all the starting seeds that they could quantify, they're within a certain tolerance, and they could quantify a benefit. So what I thought I would do is I would end by just saying a few of the ingredients that go into a proof of a statement like this. And so the structure theorem is that if you look at all of the sequences that have a given m path, it turns out that those values k1 through km converge to being independent, identically distributed geometric random variables. This is the talk where we go at warp speed. And so the k values of geometric random variables, if I want to study you know, the ratio of where I am to where I expect to be, this is going to converge to the distribution of a geometric random variable. The only problem is I'm studying things base 2. Even the Simpsons have more than two fingers, OK? If you try to count base 2, what is your leading digit? Yeah, the leading digit is not that interesting base 2. Now, if you look at all the leading digits, base 2 becomes interesting. But just the leading digit is not fun. So we want to convert this to base B. So the most forgotten log formula, who knows what the most forgotten log formula is? Yes, the change of base formula. So one of the reasons the change of base formula is so important is people's jobs used to be to calculate tables of logarithms or values of sine functions. And if you have the change of base formula, if you can do the logarithms base E, you can get them in any other base by using the change of base formula. So we can use the change of base formula, well, divide by the log of B base 2, and now we use the change of base formula. Now we've studied our number of the log base B. And so we can use this to pass to studying uh, the numbers in other bases. And so the sketch of the proof, uh, the initial attempts we did, they all failed. And the reason they failed is unlike the values of the Riemann zeta function, the 3x plus 1 is a discrete process. If you go on in probability, discreteness is very hard to work with. Continuous things are very nice. You don't have to worry, oh, is it an open interval? Is it a closed interval? Doesn't matter. Singletons have probability zero. Well, if you have something that's discrete, is it open or closed? Well, it matters now. You know, do you have that point or not? And so the main step goes, we need what's called a quantified equidistribution theorem. It's not enough to know that if I have an irrational number, you're then an alpha mod 1 is equidistributed. I need to know how quickly the equidistribution sits in. And this goes back to the pi to the n versus 2 to the n and all that stuff before with powers of 10. And so it turns out that if numbers are of rationality type kappa, you get a small power savings of 1 over kappa in terms of how quickly the equidistribution sets in. So being a little bit explicit, uh, alpha has irrational type kappa. If kappa is the supremum of all gamma, well, OK. So what this means in English, algebraic numbers have type 1. There's a theory of uh, linear forms. I'm not going to go into all the details. You can read the statement. You can prove that the log of 2 base 10 has finite irrationality type. Its type is at most 1.2 times 10 to the 602. This is the largest number that has occurred in a meaningful way in a paper I've written. So the savings I get in my exponent for my quantified equidistribution is it's at most 1 minus something that's essentially 1 over 10 to the 602. And that small power savings is all we need to prove benefitness. And so you know, going through here, here's a little bit of a sketch of how all that goes. I'm not going to go into the details. Here are just some numbers looking at the 3x plus 1 problem, looking at the observed values and the benefit. I'm choosing a 10,000 random digit number. And what's nice about questions like this is if you want to work with a 10,000 digit number, you know, if you're programming in C or an environment like this with long, this is far beyond what long can do, you save your numbers in an array. You're doing very simple operations. I'm multiplying by 3. I'm adding 1. I'm dividing by 2. The easy way to divide by 2 is you multiply by 5 and then shift uh, by removing a 0. And so you can do all of this stuff with array operations very quickly. And you can work with 10,000, 100,000 digit numbers very, very easily. This is looking at the 3x plus 1 problem, and we're pulling out the highest power of 2 we can on each step. You can also pull out just um, 1 power of 2 each time. You still get good fits. Instead of looking at 3x plus 1, you could also look at 5x plus 1. What's interesting about 5x plus 1 is you actually expect the numbers to go off to infinity. And if you look at the heuristic slide, that gives you some explanation as to why that happens. And again, you can pull out all the twos or not, and you'll still see benefitness behavior. All right, so I'm going to skip all the stick stuff. Skipped too much. Yes. And I will just leave it at you know, several pages of references. Oh, right, that, 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 well, yeah, I don't care. It skips off. Yeah, this is enough so you can hit pause, and all the references are there. OK, so thank you. <laughs>